Good evening. Welcome to the John Adams Institute. My name is Tracy Metz. I'm the director of the John Adams and also your moderator this evening. And this is our last event for before the summer. And uh, I think we're going out with a bang and not with a whimper. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, many thanks to our partners for this evening, the Bali, we love this place, we love being here, and the online news platform, The Correspondent. There is an epidemic washing over the United States, which hardly anyone has noticed until now. The epidemic is evictions, people who are kicked out of their rented houses and apartments by their landlords. This happens to no fewer than 2.3 million people a year in the US. Most of them poor, most of them black, and a majority of them poor black women with children. So many families are kicked out of their homes that the average age of a homeless person in the US now is nine years old. Nine years old, the average age. This epidemic has gone largely unnoticed by government and by the public. There's a lot more public debate, for example, about the numbers of black men being put in jail, also a big issue for the US. But this has now changed with the publication of the book Evicted, Poverty and Profit in the American City by Princeton sociologist Matthew Desmond, our guest of honor this evening. It is not only a Pulitzer Prize winning book, but also an exhibition in the National Building Museum and a website, Evicted Lab, for the lab, Desmond and his team crunched the numbers on 83, 84, he told me at dinner, million court records since 2000 in 48 states. And the site presents the data on evictions in cities all over the country in an accessible fashion. And then to think that many evictions never get to court at all. The landlords pressure their tenants to leave or the tenants leave of their own accord, own accord, before the sheriff and the movers arrive and put all their stuff out on the curb in the snow. Poverty and profit. What a strange idea that ghettos and rundown trailer parks can be profitable. But they are, if you know how to play the game. Because the rent for a dilapidated, moldy apartment filled with cockroaches and a plugged up sink and no refrigerator is often just as high nowadays as a nice place in a clean, safe, white neighborhood. The majority of poor renting families in America spend over half their income on housing costs, and eviction is transforming their lives, and not in a good way. Desmond is clear on this. Eviction isn't just a condition of poverty, it's a cause of poverty. This book brought tears to my eyes. That is not only because of the subject matter, but also because of the author's achievement as a writer. As a journalist myself, I have huge respect for the way he researched and wrote this book, living in the poorest neighborhoods of Milwaukee for two years, following the lives of tenants, but also of landlords, and writing it down in a calm, but extremely penetrating way. I was impressed, and it also made me very sad. Is there a way out? Desmond has some suggestions and we'll be talking about those after his talk. A word about this evening's program. I have invited two Dutchmen to join us this evening. It's an unusual amount for the John Adams Institute. One of them is Cody Hoogsenbach, who is a postdoc researcher at the University of Amsterdam and an emerging voice in the field of housing issues. The other is Arjen van Vele, a journalist at the online news platform, The Correspondent who lived in St. Louis for two years and has just published his book about his time in the US called Americana Lopenit, Americans Don't Walk. And Matt confirmed that. After his talk, I will have a conversation with Professor Desmond, then Arjen van Vele will read his column, then Cody Hoogsenbach will join Matt and myself for a conversation uh, also with you. After the conversation here on stage, Matt Desmond will sign his book, the English edition, and Arjen van Phelan's book will also be on sale thanks to our friends at Ateneum Bookstore. Um, Matt, at, at the, can everybody hear me? Okay. Um, I have so many questions. 
but you do too. So I'll try to contain myself. Um, at the end of the book, Matt, in one very short sentence, you tell us that the bank took your home when you were a child. Yeah. Yeah, my family got foreclosed uh, before it was all the rage. Um, so uh, I was a sophomore, junior in college. Um, and, uh, you know, like a lot of, like a lot of uh, writers, like I know less about my life in a way than I, I do about other folks' lives. And um, so I don't really know what happened. But I do know that I experienced that moment with a lot of shame and blame my parents a lot for it. Um, and I think that's how, you know, Arlene and Lorraine and other folks in my book experienced their eviction. You know, they, they just felt that it was their fault and they saw a lot of their, their, their uh, missteps. You know, when the book came out, Arlene told me, like, I see a lot of my strength, but I see a lot of my mistakes. And I think that one thing that this book has helped me see and, and, and kind of a blessing to me and a privilege is watching the folks in the book see this too, is to say, like, this isn't, this isn't just a personal thing. This can't be reduced to, to missteps if millions of Americans are in this situation. And I feel like the sociologist's job, like C. Wright Mills once said, is to take a personal problem and turn it into a public issue. And that's one thing I think that uh, the book is striving for. What was the uh, uh, emotional impact of all this research and all the time you spent in the, with these poor families in Milwaukee on you personally? Uh, mostly it was very depressing. I drank a lot. I still do. Um, I, uh, when I used to get a question like this, I used to just lie about it, like say something to get out of the question. But the answer is I was very depressed for several years after the research. And it wasn't just because of the research I did. It was because I did this research and then I moved to Harvard University, which is a very rarefied place. And the contrast between me living in inner city Milwaukee and being at a place like Harvard was very existentially confusing. You know, there'd be like a bottle of wine at some function. And I know like that, that bottle of wine could pay my friend's rent back in Milwaukee, you know? And um, so I think writing this uh, helped me get out of it. And I think that writing also reminded me that, yes, like the book, there's documents of, um, of suffering and hardship, but there's also these moments of humor and generosity and um, beauty in the face of adversity. like. I remember this one time, I uh, went over to this family's house, they're called the Hingstons in the book, and they, or their heat was off, and it was February, and they asked me to go f like, f try to f put the heat back on. And I don't know anything about that. Like, I don't know how to fix your furnace, but I'm a guy, and in America, I don't know if it's like this here, but if you're a guy in America, you have to fake it. And so I was like, oh, I'll check it out. And um, so I went, I went down to the basement and I was like, I don't know how to do this, a light switch. And then I came back up and um, it was just a ruse. They had just wanted me to go away so they can pull out this birthday cake because it was my birthday and they wanted to give me this birthday cake. Their heat was legitimately off in February, but they still like took time to like show me this kindness, you know? And I think it's, there's moments like that in the book too. And it shows you how, I don't know, like how gracefully people refuse to be reduced to their hardships. You spent a lot of time with the people you write about, not only the tenants, but also the landlords. Yep. How did you get these people to trust you? This white guy, uh, you weren't at Harvard yet, but I mean, you were obviously of a different class, time, place, everything. Why would they trust you? Yeah, I mean, um, I think that you know, it wasn't always easy. You know, some people like opened up very quickly, like a guy in my book named Scott, he, um, you know, we, we were neighbors in the trailer park and he learned that I was writing a book on this and he was facing eviction. So I said, all right, let's, let's go and we'll have breakfast at McDonald's. So I swear, this is how it happened. I met him at his door and by the time we started walking to my car and he's like, all right, here's what happened. I have a college degree. I used to be a nurse. I hurt my back. I get hooked on painkillers. That kind of spiraled into full-blown addiction. I'm an active heroin addict. That's how I, you know, I ended up in this trailer park. And I was like, okay, oh, let's go get, let's go get a McMuffin, you know? And so sometimes it happens like that. And, you know, there is a, you know, when's the last time someone like really wanted to hear your story? Just really wanted to hear you out. So there is something, there is something that um, just hearing out gives back a little bit. I don't want to romanticize this, but it's, I, I do think people take a bit from it. And then there's all, all, a bunch of other stories where it's much harder. So 
I was in the trailer park and I was living, I'd lived there for maybe a month or two. And it was just, I was just getting in. You kind of have this honeymoon period and then it's like a awkward period. Like, why are you still here? And then once you get through that, then it's kind of, you start, the work starts. And so I was in this like pretty good period. I felt it was good, but I had to go out of town for uh, several days. And uh, right when I was leaving, I was talking to this guy and he was drunk. And this other guy came up to him. He's like, don't talk to that guy. He's a spy for the city. And I was like, I'm not a spy for the city, you know? And he's like, what are you doing here? And I was like, I'm a writer. This is what I do. This is my livelihood. You know, this is what I do. And he's like, what books have you written? Show me your books. And I was like, I don't, I don't carry my books around with me. I, I don't have, but I was like, let's look them up on the internet. And he's like, I don't have the internet. I work for a living. And so I was like, this is going great. This is and, and so uh, he, he walks in, he's like, until you show me the book, you're out, you know? I don't believe you. And so night was falling. Um, I knew that if I left the trailer park in that situation, it would just be gone for me. I couldn't get back in. So I called all these local bookstores, seeing if they have my first book, and like, of course, no one did. Uh, and, um, and so I rushed to the public library, and I checked out my own book. And I thank God it had the dust jacket with the picture on it. And so I went back to his trailer and I knocked on the door and I was like, this is like late now. It was like late at night. And I was like, here you go. And, and then he like invited me in and made a ham sandwich. And that was fine. So sometimes you have to fight for it like that too. I understand why the tenants would be more uh, inclined to trust you and tell yeah. you your story and, and have you share their life. But why would the landlords want to let you in? Yeah. And you spoke to two, one of them particularly extensively, Sharina, yeah. who rides in a red Camaro and goes to Jamaica on vacation with the money that she makes off the ghetto. Yeah. I mean, it's a pretty shocking story. Yeah. Why would she want to share her story with you? I think she was really proud of her work. You know, four years before I met her, she was a she was an elementary school teacher, and she had built up a, a small real estate empire on her own merits with her own uh, kind of sweat ingenuity, and um, I think she was proud of what she did. And I think you see her in the book. It turns be kind to tenants, laugh with them, counsel them, help them with their marriages, buy groceries, evict them at Christmas, uh, be very callous with them. Um, there's, a, there's a scene in the book after a fire where there's a moment of what some readers have experienced as extreme callousness from her. And, um, but I think that she's, she feels that she, she doesn't see herself as a social worker or doing God's work or anything like that, but she does see herself as someone that is helping but also has built something by her herself. I think she also liked um, just having me around as her assistant, she called me. <laughs> her assistant. Um, there was one, well, uh, there were so many things that really struck me in this book, but one of them about poverty and their relationship to people's expectations of their lives really struck me. Let me read this. Trailer park residents rarely raised a fuss about a neighbor's eviction, whether that person was a known drug addict or not. Evictions were deserved, understood to be the outcome of individual failure. They helped to get rid of the riffraff. No one thought the poor more undeserving than the poor themselves. That is just shocking when the whole book is about systemic failure. And here are these people, perhaps because they believed in the American dream, thinking, it's all my fault that I can't do better than this. Yeah, systemic failure this is really was, hard This to was see. one of the yeah. bits that brought the tears to my eyes. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think systemic failure is hard to see, right? And, but individual failure is pretty easy to see. And when you're in a poor community, you, you help each other a lot, actually. And you, you cook for each other, you share information, um, you watch each other's kids. But in doing that, that's kind of social intercourse, you also see everyone's stuff. You know, like you see them having their gas shut off. You see them, you see their drug addiction, sometimes violence. Um, I remember one time in the trailer park I lived in, a woman's kids got removed by the state. This happens when a mother or parental figure is charged with abuse or neglect. And trailer park residents sat with her because they thought she was, would hurt herself. They did uh, like rounds to sit with her. But they also judged her, you know, and one told her, you know, it ain't nothing to be proud of, but the Lord took him for some reason. And so that stuff, the stuff you need to survive, kind of um, pushes away the stuff you need to strike, you know, in protest. Because, like, you're exposed to this collective suffering, and that could diminish, you know, the community in your own eyes. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm.
Yeah. It brings tears back to my eyes. These people in such difficult straits doing so their damnedest to make ends meet and then thinking that it's their own fault that they can. It's just, it's just so unfair. There's not a counter narrative, right? No one is really telling them it's not their fault. So their neighbors aren't telling them that, their churches aren't telling them that, their community organizations aren't telling them that, and their politicians aren't really telling them that. Okay. Um, let's move back to the audience, Matt, while we give the stage to Arjen van Vela for his column about St. Louis. Great. The stage is yours, Arjen. Would you like a glass of water? Uh, yeah. Dutch author shares shock of moving to St. Louis in new novel. Dutch columnist Arjen van Vele thought, that's me, thought he was moving to a sleepy Midwestern city that rarely made international headlines. Now he reflects on the surprise move to St. Louis in his new novel, Americans Do Not Walk. I'm quoting an article a recent news item on the website Fox 2, a local television station in the St. Louis area. And this might seem a little bit vain, especially after this moving talk by Matthew. Um, but I was really surprised. I don't know how Fox 2 found out about my book. It has not been translated into English yet. Um, apparently what they did was copy paste the first chapter from Dutch to Google Translate. <laughs> and I was surprised to learn that they, they got the gist of the first chapter. Fox 2 was right. I did publish a book about St. Louis, and yes, it's called Americans Do Not Walk. However, the editor of Fox 2 made one uh, mistake. My book is not a novel. It's non-fiction. I wish it was a novel. I wish everything was made up, because St. Louis can be very shocking. Tonight I want to share with you the shock of living two years in St. Louis. It's a Rust Belt city, a little bit like Milwaukee, uh, that has, been, has seen steady decay since the 1950s. It's one of the most segregated cities in America, which with extreme economic and racial inequality, it's a caricature of the American dream, and a perfect place to start to understand the United States of today. <clears throat> Unless, uh, Matthew Desmond, I did not go on purpose to this city to um, investigate or to be a journalist um, or do research. My job was what they call a trailing spouse. My wife's a microbiologist, and when, when she found a job at the Was U, Washington University of St. Louis, I quit my job as a, uh, at the newspaper to join her to the States. My plan was to write a novel in St. Louis. We hardly knew anything about the place before we came there, and we did not do much research apart from checking Wikipedia. Uh, I learned that Budweiser beer was brewed in St. Louis and that the Arch was the most important tourist attraction. That's about everything I knew. St. Louis seemed like a place where nothing ever happened, so that's what I told all my friends. I'm moving to a place, a sleepy city, a perfect place to write a novel. One of the first shocks was, was actually very uh, positive. The rent in St. Louis was very low, well, compared to uh, Amsterdam. Uh, while still in the Netherlands, we were hunting houses on the Craigslist, the American uh, Marktplatz. While hunting, there were plenty of homes available. We could even buy whole brick homes for a couple of months of Amsterdam rent. Uh, but we. Uh, didn't want to do a rehab, so we found a detached brick house from 1927, completely renovated with the original wooden porch, a big front and backyard, everything picture perfect. 
the house was in a, a northern suburb, uh, not far from downtown St. Louis, we saw on Google Maps, and it looked like a mansion. It was just $900, much less than our mini apartment in Amsterdam. So we flew to St. Louis, two suitcases, suitcases each, and the house turned out to be, well, exactly as advertised. So where is the catch? Well, the first shock was uh, came when we drove from our home, our new home, to uh, downtown St. Louis for the first time. The closer we got to the city center, the more dilapidated the buildings looked. Soon we were surrounded by a ghostly landscape of vacant houses, boarded up storefronts, or just completely burned down homes. A city of ruins. Just one mile, or even closer, to the university where my wife was supposed to work. So what had happened here? Uh, a tornado, a civil war, the apocalypse. Why had we not heard about this on the news? Soon a lot of people told us that we had moved to the wrong part of the city, to the north, where the black people live. That's not what they said, but that's what they, their words suggested. That was one of the reasons that our house was relatively cheap. People like us, white academics, were not supposed to live there. And why was this not on the news? Well, four weeks later, after we moved, St. Louis was in the news. On a Saturday in August, a white cop killed an unarmed black boy in Ferguson, a teenager, Michael Brown. The, uh, Ferguson was a St. Louis suburb, just 10 minutes north of where we lived. Weeks of protests followed. I think it has been on the news in the Netherlands too, a lot. Um, and instead of writing my novel, uh, as I planned, I regularly went to Ferguson to witness the events myself. I went there by bike, because I'm Dutch, and it was just a 30-minute bike ride. <clears throat> so, in the weeks that followed, I learned that the riots were about much more than this particular case of police violence. They were calls, the root causes were whole neighborhoods that were left to rot, basically. They were caused by the way schools were funded, by the lack of opportunities in general. And sometimes St. Louis in those days felt like, for me, like apartheid city, which is quite harsh, but it really did. Before I moved to the USA, I already knew that there is such a thing as inequality. But I knew this on a theoretical level. And uh, there's a difference between knowing something and seeing something with your own eyes. I had never expected to witness uh, four-year-old children begging in the streets for money to pay for the funeral of their father who had killed three days earlier, had been killed three days earlier. And I'd never expected to witness shootings or to breathe tear gas in my own neighborhood in the so-called sleepy city of St. Louis. And I'd never expected to see so many Americans actually walk in, not because they were health freaks or uh, urban explorers, but because they were too poor to afford a car and they still wanted to go to work. And public transport is not not uh, not very good there. Um, <clears throat> to f conclude, let me tell you a story of a resident in Ferguson, uh, Tony Rice is his name. He, his story explains a little bit um, why our rent was $900. He's a young uh, black man trained as a carpenter, and when the riot started in Ferguson, he had just lost his job at a furniture company where he had worked for almost seven years. Um, that day, Tony went out into the street to protest for the first time in his life. And during one of those protests, I met, I met him, and later we became friends. And one day I met him at his place, or actually not his place, because he, had, uh, he didn't have a house anymore, because um, he lost his home. Years ago, he bought a home in Ferguson for $65,000, and the bank told him it was a fair price and that he could afford it with his job at the furniture company. He did not, Tony did not have a network of family or friends to advise him, but he figured buying a home is always better than renting. So he signed the deal, and a few, after a few years, the interest on his mortgage rose and it was hidden in the fine print. He also learned that he had barely paid anything back. Uh, at a certain point, he no longer could pay the monthly expenses. His house went into the foreclosure sale. This happened years after the 2008 uh, housing crisis. Someone else bought his house for 
only $11,000. Tony himself ended up with a huge debt and without the home. And that story uh, brought him to tears when he told me the story. And it's no coincidence that it happened to him. Uh, black Americans in St. Louis and I think everywhere in the US were uh, barred from buying property for ages. And so they often rented. And they were uh, easy prey for the sellers with bad mortgages. They were the first generation buyers with, without much uh, experience or a network to advise them. Um, and this is not a story about 2008. In the, the months prior to the uh, riots in Ferguson, 2014, uh, at least a quarter of all houses that were for sale in Ferguson were foreclosure sales. It was like the housing crisis never uh, disappeared there. It was like a permanent crisis. Uh, a crisis that creates a, f a vicious circle. As property values went down, the, and the tax base of the city of Ferguson shrunk, school, schools were uh, getting worse because the funding of public schools uh, depends on the property value of an area, which is a crazy system, uh, perpetuating uh, po poverty. Schools were getting worse. People who could afford were leaving. Tax base of the city shrunk even further. And the city of Ferguson started uh, looking for alter alternative sources of income. And they decided that uh, to use the police as a cash cow. They started ticketing their own citizens like crazy. And property values plummeted. Court fines and fees skyrocketed. More people got, got into financial troubles. More homes were foreclosed. Anyway, vicious circle with one positive outcome that my landlord could buy homes for very, very cheap. So the 900 dollar rent we paid was made for us cheap, but for him it was a very, very good deal probably if you buy a home for only $20,000. Anyway, it was four years ago, 2014. Uh, I lived there for two years, uh, not that place because we moved. We went to the city center of St. Louis. Today is 2018. Four years later, there's a new president. And this morning I checked Zillow.com, the American version of uh, Funda. And I looked for houses for sale in Ferguson. And guess what? 25% of the houses on the market right now are foreclosures there. The situation hadn't changed a bit. And that's one of the conclusions of my book, Americans Do Not Walk, um, that the situation hadn't, hasn't changed at all. That it, for a, lot of Ameri for a lot of Americans, the crisis is permanent. Whoever is president, it doesn't matter. American, America's problem is not Donald Trump. The big problem is extreme, persistent inequality. And that's not fiction. That's a harsh reality. Thank you. Are you in this, whoa, excuse me, I'm too close. Uh, this image behind us of the Arch of St. Louis. Um, in a blog that you wrote for our website, you have three blogs on our website based on your book, you suggest that the Arch of St. Louis should be the icon of the U.S. instead of the Statue of Liberty. Why is that? Well, there's a lot of reasons. Uh, one is it's, in, it's located in the heartland, so it's a real American. The other reason, it's, it's very beautiful, but it also reflects the, uh, the um, how, how do you say, the history of the United States when it comes, for example, the, the arch was built on ground where uh, a lot of Afro-Americans lived, so they were, uh, it was a, they were uh, evicted. Evicted? Yeah. <laughs> and it was built to celebrate the uh, westward expansion so uh, I think uh, the Jefferson, uh, the official name is the Jefferson something. Well, I can't remember exactly. But there, there, it's um, it's both. Um, it was built in the 60s, so there was a space age, and it was very optimistic age, and it's uh, symbolic of the brutality in, in both in good and bad ways of the United States, and it's. Uh, 
Yeah. So, so it's a much more apt symbol, you'd say, than the Statue of Liberty. Yeah, I think yeah. a Statue of Liberty is, is a beautiful uh, statue, but it's uh, giving the wrong, sending the wrong message, especially right now, to people in Broth. And, and it's, uh, a, it's the wrong logo. Any chance of this happening? No. Well, t today, today is the uh, uh, the arch was completely uh, renovated for. Um, I think they spent four hundred million dollar oh. on this statue. Uh, <laughs> But it's it's. Uh, Which in your blog you call the Statue of Unliberty. Yeah. Yeah. But it's it's now. Uh, I think it will be there for another two. Uh, two uh, centuries at least. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, Arjen. Uh, and. Yeah. Yeah. And in addition to the three blogs by Arjen and an interview with him by Catherine October Matthews, we have another uh, whole set of blogs leading up to this event, an interview with uh, Matt Desmond, also by Catherine October Matthews, uh, and um, uh, uh, a blog about the exhibition in the National Building Museum by Lisa Geurts, who is in, the, uh, in Washington, D.C. this summer as a Fulbright Fellow studying international political journalism. So she seemed like uh, just the right person to write about this show. May I invite Matt back to the stage together with Cody Holstenbach. Cody, thank you for joining us. I asked you to join us because um, I, the, the, the increasing grip of the market on housing in the Netherlands is a big issue and you are in the public eye about that a lot. So I was curious to hear your reaction to Matt's talk and what you think that we can learn in the Netherlands from this, by Dutch standards, quite extreme example in the US. Definitely. Well, uh, first of all, thank you for your uh, presentation and also for your very inspiring book. I want to get that out first. Um, but what can we learn from Matthew Desmond's book talking about this very extreme American housing crisis? And I think there's various aspects we can learn uh, from the book. Um, one of the things you were talking about already before I am van Velen's column was the idea, the very dominant narrative that um, the contemporary uh, housing crisis and the vulnerable situations people find themselves in is a product of individual failure. What you also often see is that this is also the case in the Netherlands. When people struggle to pay the monthly rent, this is blamed on the individual rather than on, um, on systemic failures. What you also see is that when we're talking about um, increasing housing prices in Amsterdam, decreasing affordability, we tend to think about market efficiency. How can we increase supply to balance supply and demand on the housing market? But I think what Matthew Desmond uh, shows in his book um, is that it's mostly a political housing crisis, political housing crisis in the first place. And it's exactly about this point, and it's also something I recognize in Amsterdam and in the rest of the Netherlands, is that this political housing crisis is basically about balancing, um, balancing private property rights with um, the right to basic, secure, decent and affordable housing. And I think what the United States does is prioritizing the former in, in a lot of cases, prioritizing your right to use your house as a profit making machine, as an ATM, so to say. And then, meanwhile, curbing other people's right to decent and affordable and secure housing. And that's a political problem, I think. And this political problem where we view homes primarily as investment objects, or increasingly so, is also an issue in the Netherlands. And it, uh, it, it feeds a particular Dutch housing crisis, which lacks some of the extreme bits uh, Matthew has emphasized tonight. But it's, it feeds a very particular Dutch housing crisis. Matt, you said at one point in your book that there are two freedoms in conflict here. There's the freedom of property rights to make a profit on your property, and the freedom, or perhaps we should better say the right, to have a stable roof over your head. Right, and those freedoms are often are antagonistic to each other. And one of the things that I was interested in when I started the book was like, why would you buy a home in the middle of inner city Milwaukee? And then when I, when I left, I was like, well, why wouldn't you do that? Because you can make a really healthy profit. And so we've now crunched the numbers for this national 
um, survey of landlords that the census did a few years ago, and we found that in almost every market in America, the profit margins for landlords in very poor neighborhoods are much, much higher than they are for landlords in middle class neighborhoods. And the reason is their property values are a lot lower. You can buy a house in North St. Louis or East St. Louis for $18,000 or $20,000. So property value is a lot lower, their mortgage is a lot lower, their property tax is a lot lower, but their rent isn't that much lower. And, um, and so it suggests a big policy implication there where when landlords just say, like, you can't impose this restriction on me or this legislation on me because you know, I'm barely making it, the data, the data tell a different story. At dinner before this evening, we were talking about, we were sort of giving you a 101 on the, on the Dutch housing situation. Uh, and I saw you look up when you heard that uh, in Amsterdam, what is it now? 47% of the housing stock is low in income middle housing, social 43, rent. 43% of the housing association. Okay. So and and I, I saw action. you looking, Matt, with an expression on your face like, these are problems that we would really like to have. We would, and we'd like to have your bicycle traffic jams as well. We'll take those. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that... Um, I think that the security uh, that's exhibited in the city like Amsterdam is unmatched in, in, in America. Yeah, what I think is very important is that Matthew in his epilogue, he sort of describes a way out of the American housing crisis. And at some point you mention the Dutch housing system as some sort of example, something to strive towards. And I would definitely agree that the Dutch housing crisis is far removed from the things we see and you describe so uh, uh, well, so humanly in your book. Um, but what's very interesting, even though you mention uh, our rich history of um, social rental housing and um, social renting housing available for a large share of the population, shielding a large share of the population from market forces, giving them high share, uh, low rents, high tenant protection. But what's very interesting, you as an outsider, you look at this very positively, but successive Dutch governments, national governments, have done their utmost to get rid of our social housing tradition. We see that the size of the social rental sector is decreasing. We're weakening tenant rights. We're introducing, for example, short-term rentals, while permanent rental contracts used to be uh, permanent, uh, used to be the standard. And we see that rent, social, social renting in the Netherlands increasingly becomes a last resort tenure, only for those who have really no other options left available. So while an outsider praises the Dutch social housing tradition, our governments, our national governments, are doing away with it. And it's not just the last government. No, this is successive national governments which try to eradicate our social housing, meanwhile keeping the mortgage interest tax deductibility more or less stable. So, like uh, Matthew already showed in his presentation, also in the Netherlands, we subsidize homeowners way more than we subsidize low-income tenants. Especially with the... Uh, things like the, the mortgage interest uh, deduction. Um, do we still have with us this evening uh, Rutger Grootwassink? He didn't st You're all the way at the back? Can you come down up front? Wow. <laughs> Sorry about this. <laughs> I'll tell you, yeah. Okay, uh, Rutger Groot Wassink uh, was the chair of the party called uh, GroenLinks, Green Left, and is now the alderman of a million things. Are you the alderman of what? The wethouder? Um, hi everyone, sorry. Um, uh, alderman of social affairs, diversity, anti-discrimination, um, democratization, and undocumented. Okay. That's why I couldn't remember. <laughs> I'm curious how you, as an outspoken proponent of social housing and a more social approach to the market, um, uh, look at uh, what Matt tells us about what seemed to us incredible excesses in the US. How does, how does this strike you? Well, um, I'm extremely shocked by, uh, by these figures. And I'm also shocked by um, uh, the numbers. And we were talking uh, earlier that, that um, people are that, that evictions are even more likely to happen when there are children involved in Amsterdam. We try to ban evictions of families, and uh, in the U.S. that, the, that you get ev evicted sooner when there are kids involved. It's, it, 
it's outrageous for me. Um, but in, I, I see some parallels, as Cody was, was, was saying, that, that there is a, a, a huge crisis on housing, on affordable housing, especially in Amsterdam. And also, there is this notion also in the Netherlands that it's your own fault if you're poor, uh, and that there, there's nothing like a systematic crisis or a system fail. Uh, and I think that it's um, up to politicians to, and, and up to social society and up to activists um, to make sure that, that we don't experience these uh, uh, kinds of situations. We've given much more over to the market since the 90s already. Um, are you in favor of government taking back more control of the housing section, which is a question I will also put to Matt in a moment. Yes, definitely. I think that there should be a, a, a huge reservoir of affordable houses that uh, the government, the, the city government, uh, has some kind of influence upon. Because uh, I think that if you want to keep Amsterdam, Amsterdam, if you want to keep a city vibrant and alive, uh, then you have to make sure that there's a place for everyone. And you do that by um, making it, 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 in a sense, to regulate markets and to to, to to, to toughen up your grip uh, upon affor affordable houses. If you don't, um, uh, we see what happens in Amsterdam, then it's market ruling all the way. And um, that will mean that affordable housing will, in the end, in the long run, uh, will be gone. Mm. Are we too late in Amsterdam? Last question, Rutger. <laughs> you can't say yes, because you've got to solve this now. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, um, Keynes used to say, in the long run, we're all dead, but... Um, uh, oh, thanks, that uh, helps. <laughs> no, I, I don't think we're too late, but uh, I think that we have to be aware that the, 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 the political debate in the Netherlands, and maybe Cody can tell something about that, the political debate is, is, is anti-social housing. Um, uh, and I think that in Amsterdam, we can still make a change, and we can still make sure that we have enough affordable houses, but that will be... Uh, Cody earlier today called it an uphill battle with the national government and well I look forward to that <laughs> you have your work cut out for you my friend yeah thank you thank you thanks very much <laughs> yeah, <fine. laughs> um, questions from you in a moment after I ask Matt what he sees as the new role of government in the US under Trump I don't think anything's gonna change uh, my colleague's uh, last point, though, about uh, enduring inequality in America is one well taken, though. I mean, our poverty rate in America hasn't changed since the presidency of Lyndon B. Johnson. So for the last 60 years, you know, the poverty rate in America has remained uh, stable uh, through Democratic and Republican candidates. I don't think this issue is a bipartisan issue. This isn't an issue that should be owned by one party or the other. This should be a broadly American issue. I think the good news is that this issue is raising to the top of the domestic agenda. I think the next step is seeing uh, what we can do to, to fight it, though. Has that been the impact of your project? I think that my Feel free to say yes. I think that my book has added to a large number of voices from all over the country uh, calling out against this. It's um, voices coming from teachers that are saying, like, we teach kids in the city, but we can't allow, we can't afford to live here anymore. It's coming from public sector unions that are saying the same thing. It's coming from the same teachers that say, uh, how do you expect me to um, wrench the full potential out of these children if they're bouncing from one school to the next every year? It's coming from hospitals that are recognizing that the top 5% of hospital users are consuming half of the costs which are the chronically homeless with health issues. It's coming from police departments that know that neighborhoods with more evictions have higher violent crime rates because eviction fractures the social fabric of community and dilutes the stuff of community that allows us to keep our neighborhoods safe. And so I think that's important. I think translating that broader sentiment into a massive national investment in housing is another matter. Maybe Would to you like to react, Cody? Well, so... Inequality is constantly reproduced in the United States, I guess, and it's really deeply ingrained. And I think much of the political debate about the Netherlands is we're moving in that direction. We're not there yet, but it's already worrisome that we're moving in that direction. If we look at evictions, for example, 
we tend to think evictions don't occur in the Netherlands, but that's not true. Um, earlier today, I invited a professor from Groningen to Amsterdam, Michel Vos, who is also in the audience, uh, who shows that also in, Amster sorry, in the Netherlands, there's thousands of evictions from rental units each year. Some other data, you see that between 2009 and 2016, the number of homeless people in the Netherlands increased by 70%. Um, you see that 18% of Dutch tenants struggle to meet the monthly rent. So 18. So that's not as severe as Matthew Desmond describes for uh, the United States. But we also see worry, worrisome data, and we see the trend in the direction of the United States. Um, also, when you look, for example, at segregation levels between uh, rich people and poor people, or between um, migrant population groups and native Dutch population groups, these segregation levels are lower than in the US, but they're increasing. Is uh, Michiel Vols indeed in the, in the hall? Okay. Um, we actually announced your talk uh, on our site today, uh, Professor Vols, at the Center for Urban Studies, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, can you come down into the light so everybody can see you? <laughs> Into the light. Okay. So rates of eviction are on the increase. That's worrisome. Yes. Yeah, so they are they're in, on the increase, but not as bad as in the states. Um, so we don't know. We actually, I just had an international conference, so people ask us, so how many people are evicted in the Netherlands? I said, so we don't know. We actually know better how many Labrador dogs there are in the Netherlands than people that are made homeless in the Netherlands. What? Yeah, so we don't know. Courts don't track if you're, there are even people uh, evicted from their own home, uh, owner occupied home. So if you own your own home because you don't pay mortgage or because you're a drug dealer, you can get evicted by the mayor. We don't know. They don't even have to co go to court. Rental, uh, uh, social rental sector, we know something because the housing association, they publish something, but it's only an estimate. And because the rental market on the private rental sector is on the rise, we don't, know, we don't have a clue. Uh, it's not as bad as in the States, I'm for sure. And I had some You just hope so. You just you just hope so. No, yeah, so we yeah, so I, I had some questions for Matt because We need an eviction lab dot NL. So we're building one. So we're building a lot of so we're collecting like hundreds of court cases. Eighty four million, huh? Yes, yeah, so we have a problem because of privacy rules, we cannot do the same as Matt did. Uh, because there the there are actually companies that buy or sell uh, the court cases to make uh, the blacklist available for the landlords. Mm -hmm. But we cannot do that because of all the privacy rules. Remember all the emails you get? Uh, GDPR stuff. Exactly. So we cannot do that, which is great, of course, because then we cannot blacklist. But for a researcher, it's horrible. Uh, so I would love to have the same thing. Um, but you had questions for him. Yes. Yeah, so what my, my main question was, so or two, three short questions. So, okay. But they're short. Right. So That's first. Like the professor's one question. Uh, yes. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can, I treat, you yeah. can borrow my pen, Matt, if you'd like to. I'm good. Oh, there, there, there are short questions. So first, I, I'm looking at sol a solution and also combining them to or comparing them with the Dutch situation. So one, so one of your solution is housing vouchers. So aren't you afraid that it just increases the rents? So shouldn't that com should, should, shouldn't you combine that with rent control mechanisms as we have in the Netherlands? Second one, um, the states uh, is is one of the only one of the few countries in the world that doesn't re uh, ratify the international rights of the child, which is it's just horrible, right? So even Algeria has done that. The states refuse to do that. And also there's no right to housing. So do you think that will make a difference in, 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 this, in this respect? Because, and that's my third and last question, de Blasio in New York City now gives people the right to counsel, so to an actual lawyer, because you don't, most people don't have a lawyer. Yeah. Um, do you think that will actually help if you don't grant people the right to housing or uh, something like substantial rights? So maybe they have a lawyer, but they will lose anyway because they don't have a right to rely on. So that were my three questions. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. And uh, be coming back to you in a moment. Matt. There's no evidence that increasing vouchers will increase rents. There's one study that suggests that the cities with more vouchers have higher rents. All else equal, that study's uh, an outlier, and, and most of our evidence doesn't suggest that it uh, could. Now, that could be the case that we don't dose it. We haven't dosed 
the issues much. So if we poured all these vouchers in the market, would that have a larger market effect? And you know, should there be some regulation? The beauty of the American voucher system is that there actually is regulation built into the system. It's a deal with landlords. It says, we will subsidize your rent, but up to a point. So there's a soft kind of rent control in the voucher system. The reason that the book comes down on that uh, policy instead of building more public housing or anything else was because I always cared about scale. Like the unlucky majority. What can we do for them now? And if we built our way out of this, it would cost us a lot more money and take a lot more time than if we did it through a public-private partnership. And so there's no study in the universe that shows that you can offer housing at cheaper for better quality than you can through a voucher system in the United States. And we have the supply. Um, so that's, that was my suggestion. The second question was about, um, what was it about? I should have wrote this down. Oh yeah, I, I think a right to housing would matter a lot. I was in Sao Paulo last summer and they have a right to housing in the Brazilian constitution. And so when there's an abandoned like uh, hotel in the middle of the city, folks just like march in, you know, to the, the hotel and they hang flags out and they tell the Brazilian state, you said we had a right to housing and no one was using this place. And the Brazilian state's like, we said that, we did say that. You know, and so a right can actually matter even in a resource constrained environment. So I think that's absolutely uh, should be a part of the progressive agenda. I think the third question about the right to counsel in housing court is a step in the right direction. So in America, uh, if you get arrested for a crime, you have a right to an attorney, but you have no such right in civil court where evictions, foreclosures are processed. Uh, you talk about us being behind the ball on this one, like uh, Azerbaijan has this right, Zambia has this right. And so, you know, this is uh, something that we're very behind um, the times with. This has been extended in New York City and then just a few weeks ago in San Francisco. And so I do think it's a right a step in the right direction. Uh, studies show that, surprise, surprise, when you have a lawyer by your side, your chances of eviction go down, irrespective of the merits of the case. But it doesn't address the underlying cause of the affordable housing crisis. And I think we have to strike at the root issue. I have a question for you. <laughs> How many Labradors are there in the Netherlands? <laughs> well, were you serious? Do we really know? Yes, so we know. I don't know by heart. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to know. <laughs> Questions? Yes, sir. An, another uh, important book about poverty in the United States is from uh, Schaefer and Eden about uh, Americans living on $2 a day, where they particularly accuse other industries like the plasma industry, which is part of the pharmaceutical companies, to make misuse of the poorer people. Was that also what you experienced in your studies? So uh, my colleague uh, Catherine Eden at Princeton and Luke Schaefer at the University of Michigan wrote a very important book called uh, Two Dollars a Day. And what has happened, what happened, right, after welfare reform, which was the Democrats in America uh, got welfare reform through because uh, that was necessary for the midterm re-election of President Clinton. Um, then they held their breath and looked at the poverty rate because they thought the children poverty rate would skyrocket. Uh, Senator Patrick Moynihan of Massachusetts famously said, children will be sleeping on heating grates. And it didn't happen. It didn't happen. Poverty rate actually went down. And so the Democrats were like, we dodged a bullet on this one. But they should have just waited a little bit. And what this book shows is like um, this rise of extreme poverty in America. The number of children living on no more than $2 a day in America has increased almost 300% since welfare reform. And so you have this like rising inequality below the um, poverty line, where for the working poor, the near poor, things have actually gotten better, but for the, the, the very extreme poor, they've gotten a lot uh, worse. Uh, the plasma industry is something that's rose up along with other kind of predatory industries like payday loans is something that serves and catches that kind of like bottom uh, of American uh, class uh, society. In my experience, the, the jobs that people were working were very uh, unstable. They didn't have uh, regular hours. They were working poverty wages. America's minimum wage right now is $7.25. or seven dollars and twenty-five cents. If it was tacked to productivity, it'd be $21 an hour, but it's $7, and it didn't come with any benefits. Sociologists literally call these jobs bad jobs. 
That's our word for them. And so I think that they they were right to like have a. I mean, when I read that book, one thing that I get is just this complete cruelty of exposure to the market at the very bottom. And I think they were right, uh, right in that critique. Yes. Evelyn, can you go up there and I'll come to you in a moment? In your answer, Could you stand up, please? Um, in your answer to um, why there was so little um, attention for systemic failure, um, you said there's no counter-narrative. And my question is, where do you think this counter-narrative is going to come from? Because it's not going to come from the poor. It's, com it's going to come from sociologists, people who have studied and are part of the establishment. But those are the ones who are very often criticized as being part of the establishment and not paying attention to the poor. Well, they are the ones who, who I think uh, have the ability to come up with this kind of counter-narrative and, and, and make something like systemic failure apparent, while they're very often not trusted at the same time. So how do you deal with this kind of problem? And where is this counter-narrative that's, I think, important for political reasons going to come from? If it comes from sociologists, I think we're in quite trouble. Um, <laughs> I think it should come from the communities that are most affected by that. And I think that the one thing that we can do is to elevate the voices of those communities. So in the exhibit on eviction that Tracy mentioned at the beginning, uh, what we forefront is the voices of children and mothers who have been evicted, kind of telling their stories. There's a very powerful video at the end of the exhibit where we ask folks who have been evicted, like, what can we do to help? And they're giving voice to that. I think that one thing that we've seen in the past 10 years in America that's been very encouraging is a broad-based critique of mass imprisonment, how many, how many folks are in prison in America. That critique came from sociologists like me. They were crunching the numbers and found that, wow, one in 100 Americans are behind bars at the height of the crisis. There's massive racial inequalities. It's mostly poor folks behind bars. But it also came when folks that were, get, were, that were part of that problem got out of prison and started telling their own stories, writing their own books, working on those do, their own documentaries, and sitting across the table from federal policymakers sharing their stories. So I think that I think the counter narrative can come from a lot of places. I think it must come from the communities most affected by it. Maybe, maybe to add to yeah, uh, Desmond totally. shortly, um, when I look at uh, my own research on housing affordability and inequality in Amsterdam, there has been a housing crisis in Amsterdam for a long time, but nobody cared until a couple of years ago. And I think, I think the cruel thing is a counter narrative about the current housing affordability, current housing crisis only started to emerge a couple of years ago when the middle class themselves started to struggle. People like me, we appreciate the uh, trendy bars in the, in the city, but can't afford to rent anymore. As soon as the journalists start to struggle themselves, that's the point when a counter narrative, but a very middle class counter narrative narrative, so probably not a sufficiently, not a sufficiently uh, effective counter-narrative emerges. Yes, ma'am. I, I was just wondering, you have incredible data. I was wondering, have you had an audience with the current U.S. administrative government, those that are making federal policies? Have you met with the, the White House office to show them and share this data yet? We have, yeah. Ram it down their throats? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we have. Um, testified in front of Congress uh, a few weeks after the data came out. And one thing that I said is, like, I shouldn't be the one collecting these data because I might get bored in a few years and you guys should do this. And uh, that kind of seemed to catch on. Um, I think that what the data do is allow us to take a problem that's been in the dark and bring it into the light. And we've presented the data in such a way that um, spurs uh, We've been, um, we had politicians in mind when we released the data. So for example, we rank every American city on their eviction rate. So the, the folks that are like the mayors in the top evicting cities are really paying attention to us right now. Uh, we show that the eviction problem isn't just one on the coasts in America or in big cities. It's in rural communities and suburban communities, which means if politicians take this problem on the stump, they're not only talking to their constituents in, in cities. So we did have that, that, that in mind. Um, 
Uh, the federal government right now in America is a bit different than it's been in a few in recent times. So we're, I think we're all still trying to, to figure that out. Um, can you stand up? Yeah, can you, can you do that? Oh, my girl. Thank you. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm going to go far right. I'm going to go right and ask you, in view of your research and the statistics you've presented, um, what, is it, what is your opinion when you consider the housing crisis and noting that if someone has been incarcerated and come out, they're not eligible for social housing? The eviction status, they're not eligible for social housing. In millions of the hundreds of kids that you witness, and now let's go right, real right. And now the crisis that we see with the borders and the children at the borders crying and the separation. How do you feel when America says, we can't take them in, but we're not dealing with our own issues? Because we have plenty. What are your thoughts on that? Wow. I think that um, it's a big question. You know, I think that um, one thing that we should recognize is the irony of America's border policy. Um, so when we started militarizing the borders, I'm sure you know, we before that we had a very porous border between uh, Mexico and the United States. People would come and go as work required. And when we started militarizing that border in the mid-80s and then up through, uh, up through the 2000s, we actually locked in our undocumented population. So we didn't keep people from coming in, but we did keep people from leaving because leaving became much more dangerous and high stakes. So the, the policies that were designed to like decrease uh, undocumented immigration actually had the unanticipated consequence of increasing and creating like a semi per permanent undocumented population in America. So I think from a, just a policy perspective, um, it's not working. You're asking a different kind of question though, I feel, which is like, all right, we've got all sorts of poor folks that, were, that are struggling and they're below the poverty line and they're born on these shores. And we have all sorts of folks that are coming across the border and, um, and are competing for, and to, to what degree are they competing for resources and jobs? And the evidence is really mixed on this question. The, the data don't give us a clear answer. Some data do suggest there's a job competition. Uh, some data don't suggest that there's two different kind of markets. Some data suggests that um, immigrants um, do have a, uh, uh, do tax the public safety net in some respects, specifically the public school system. Uh, others uh, suggest that it's not really a strong finding. There's very little evidence uh, that immigrants increase crime. In fact, there's a lot more evidence in the opposite direction. So the higher levels of immigrants actually lead to decreased crime. I think America is big enough and has enough resources to handle um, both issues in a humane, just uh, way. Uh, this is not the direction uh, that America is going at time for either, either population. And there's a part of me that's like, okay, if we had the strong anti-immigrant narrative um, that's at the service of the downtrodden in America, that would be one thing, right? But we don't have that. We have a strong anti-immigration narrative that's actually enforcing policies that actually increase undocumented immigration and no strong effort to decrease poverty for native-born Americans either. So it's a lose-lose. We have time. Oh, 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 please. We have time for one last question. Um, this lady sitting on the corner. Um, I have a question. Uh, those houses that the landlords have that are so dilapidated and all, are there actually no laws that require them to keep a certain standard that they have to provide uh, what you're paying for? And I had one other question. Um, is there anything that we, after listening to this, and I heard the silence while you talked, it's affected, I think, all of us, that we can do, even though we're Americans living abroad, to 
take action or do something um, to facilitate or make it more aware of, um, hey, something needs to be done here? Mm. Thank you, Cheryl. Mm -hmm. So there, there are regulations. There are a lot of laws in the books. And when I'm talking to American audiences, I usually say, if you and I looked at these laws, we'd think they're pretty OK. I wouldn't say that to this audience. But like, from an American point of view, if we looked at the laws, I think we'd say, these are pretty fair. You know, um, If a landlord doesn't uh, keep the property up to certain code, you can withhold your rent. You can escrow your rent. You can even keep it until the landlord does it. If the landlord does it uh, maintain code, the tenant can call the city. The city has to come out and inspect the property. And they, they write down all the violations. And they find the landlord until it's fixed. And then the landlord evicts the tenants who ratted on them. Right. So that's the thing. And so the problem is those laws literally cost money. So if you're a tenant who can pay your rent on time every month, guaranteed, not a problem for you. You can take advantage of those laws, those rights afforded to you. But if you're someone like Arlene and you move in, the landlord says, you need to pay me first month's rent, security deposit, and you can barely pay the first month's rent, the landlord might say, I'll let you slide on the security deposit. So you move in, in and you're behind from day one. And that's like a, uh, it's kind of like a low, low agreement. So you get housing, but it's substandard because the landlord can like slip on repairs. Not because it's legal to do so, but because the tenant knows that if she exercises those rights, she increases her odds of eviction. So it's kind of like if we don't fix the fundamental problem of like the lack of market power at the bottom, then we can't like impose a bunch of rights and think they're going to uh, work. I think for folks living abroad, um, I think that my colleague might say, take this as a, as a Claritin call about you know, what uh, a drift toward London and a drift toward uh, Milwaukee could look like um, in an extreme way. But I also think just keeping and telling these stories uh, is itself important. I think narratives can change policy and can do uh, a lot of good, but it, it, has, to be, um, it has to be a multi-vocal uh, effort. Uh, before I make some closing remarks, Matt, I'd like to ask you one final personal question. This has been a huge journey for you with a big personal impact and emotional and, and an amazing amount of work with the exhibition, this enormous website. Just writing the book was a, an intense effort. Will this be your subject for the rest of your professional life? Where do you see yourself moving on from here? Is, can you, is there anything else that, can, that you can move into that will have the same gripping power? OK. So <laughs> um, I'm pretty busy with this problem at the moment. Um, there's a lot to do. There's a lot of big questions that we don't know. So we're on to that. But I'm starting a new project that's different. And, uh, and it's about American inequality. It's just too early to tell you about it. Yeah. Are you sure? Really? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You can whisper. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> um, please check our website, www.john-adams.nl, for the seven-part blog on uh, leading up to the, this wonderful evening about uh, the rash of evictions. Tomorrow, if everything goes according to plan, the video of our evening with Madeleine Albright and Franz Timmermans will also be up on our site. So if you weren't able to make that evening, you can watch the video. Uh, the book of Arjen van Vele, Americans, uh, Americana Lopenis, and Evicted, Matt Desmond's last plug, are for sale out here with our friends from Ateneum Buchhandel, and Matt will be signing right here. Okay. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.